Hi. Um, yeah, let me get started here. Um, so I'm going to share my PowerPoint screen here. Just a moment. Okay. Um, thank you. So uh, as Alex said, uh, my talk will be on COVID-19, healthcare access, and justice. Um, I'm Derek Baker from the Department of Philosophy. I'd like to thank everyone for coming here to watch this. Um, just a little bit briefly about me. Um, there's a picture of me teaching in the age of the pandemic. Um, I'm a, an associate professor of philosophy, um, and uh, I'm originally from California, but I've been living in Hong Kong for 11 years, and I teach classes on ethics, political philosophy, philosophy of law, and some other related topics. Um, the philosophy department at Lingnan is uh, a very good department. I'm happy to be a member of it. Um, there's a number of uh, advantages to this department. It has a very international faculty, um, and we cover a number of different areas, um, logic, ethics, political philosophy, history and philosophy of science, Chinese philosophy. So, um, you know, if you find any of these topics interesting, you may want to check out our website and give the department a look. Um, let me move on here to the problem, though, that I'm here to give this lecture on. So the big question is, how should we distribute a COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available? And this was the topic of a class that I taught over the summer for a summer class um, that I was teaching at the university on bioethics. Uh, bioethics is the topic of how moral and ethical considerations relate to medical decisions and medical care. So we're trying to understand what would be a just or a fair way to distribute a vaccine for COVID-19 when it becomes available. We'll start here with a little bit of background. Um, so, as you may be aware, in February and March of 2020, hospitals in Northern Italy were forced to ration medical resources for COVID-19 patients. There weren't enough hospital beds, there weren't enough ventilators, there weren't enough intensive care units to treat all of the patients, and so some patients had to be denied treatment which would usually mean that they died, okay? So given this, an Italian medical association recommended, they've put out a um, series of recommendations for how to ration healthcare, for how to decide whom to treat and whom to deny treatment to, given that there wasn't enough treatment to go around. And so they suggested setting age limits not treating people who were over a certain age, and they suggested not treating people who already had significant enough health problems. The thinking being that even if you treated these people, they were likely to die anyway, and even if they survived, they, because of bad health or because of age, would probably die in a few years anyway. So the thought was, um, if we treat these people, we're going to allow a number of other people who don't receive treatment to die, and we won't be providing much of a benefit, okay? These recommendations um, were justified on two grounds. One ground was that hospitals could not simply set a policy of first come, first serve. That is treating patients when they showed up, until they ran out of beds or ICU room, ICU uh, rooms or ventilators. Okay, this would, if they were to do things this way, it would result in more deaths, patients who they would have had a better chance of saving may not get treatment, and there was a concern that it, this would encourage people to rush the hospital before it was necessary. Okay. Um, sorry, just one second. That this would encourage 
people to rush the hospital before necess it was necessary, right? So people would try to come into the hospital early to make sure they got a bed, even though maybe their case was not so serious and they could stay at home, leaving room in the hospital for people with more serious conditions. Okay. Second, rationing was justified, in this way was justified on utilitarian grounds. Utilitarianism is um, a moral philosophy. It's a view about what makes actions right and wrong or what makes policies just and unjust. We have, you can see here the founder of utilitarianism, Jeremy Bentham, old English philosopher, summing up the view. The view is create all the happiness you are able to create, remove all the misery you are able to remove. And so the thought is, in this case, the policies we're deciding on would let us save the most number of lives. There's going to be misery, whatever we do, but we can minimize the amount of misery by saving the most number of lives. Okay, but these recommendations were very controversial, and this is not surprising. Utilitarianism is also very controversial. Here's the American philosopher, John Rawls, stating an objection that a lot of people have to utilitarianism. It says each person possesses an inviolability founded on justice, that even the welfare of society as a whole cannot override. Justice does not allow that sacrifices imposed on a few are outweighed by a larger sum of advantages enjoyed by the many. And Rawls here, I mean, what if you think about in this particular case, you can understand what he's saying is saying, look, you can't sacrifice a small number of older people or people who are unhealthy simply to be, bring larger benefits to society. That's unfair to them. That's unjust. Maybe it violates their rights. Okay. And so this is one of the big questions in philosophy is deciding between utilitarian moral views and the types of moral views that have been advocated by people like the German philosopher Immanuel Kant and John Rawls, who is oftentimes understood to be a follower of Kant. Okay, so fortunately, we haven't had to, people in general around the world have not had to ration uh, hospital beds, ventilators, or ICUs in the way that Italy did earlier this year. But it's very likely that questions about rationing are going to come up again. And the reason why is because even after a vaccine is developed, manufacturing um, sufficient amounts and distributing the vaccine will take a long time. Okay, so initially the vaccine will be scarce, there will not be enough to go around, and it will become available to people slowly. So this raises the question, in what order should people get access? Well, can we just let the market decide? Can we just let people purchase the vaccine if they want, not purchase it if they don't want to, and distribute it that way? The concern is that this is going to make the vaccine extremely expensive very quickly, and so lots of poorer people will be priced out. And sometimes prices going up can be a good thing, right? Sometimes prices going up can be a good thing because it encourages manufacturers to, just, to provide more. It encourages more people to manufacture the good in question. But in the case of this vaccine, we're going to be manufacturing it as quickly as possible. Higher prices are unlikely to speed things up. Okay. So we need some policy. What policy would be good? Well, everyone agrees frontline medical workers should receive the vaccine first. Uh, the utilitarian, Jeremy Bentham would agree. After all, the frontline medical workers 
save the lives of lots of other people. So by saving their lives, you're actually saving the lives of lots of other people. And if we're concerned about fairness, it seems like the frontline medical workers are risking their lives, they're risking exposure to COVID-19 in order to help the rest of us. So it does seem fair that they would receive the vaccine first. The question is who receives it after that? Let's see how much time have we got. Okay. Are there any questions at this point, by the way? If not, I'll move on here. Sorry, one second. Okay. So, who received the vaccine after the frontline medical workers? Well, the utilitarian answer would be to give the vaccine first to those for whom it will save the greatest number of expected life years, okay? What does it mean to save expected life years? What's the idea here? Um, it's a little complicated, but it's a reasonably simple calculation. The idea is they make an estimate of how long a person is likely to live with the vaccine, and they make an estimate of how long a person is likely to live without the vaccine. And they subtract that second number from the first number, right? How long will I probably live with the vaccine minus how long will I live without it, okay? And so what this is going to mean, again, much like the recommendations of the Italian Medical Association, very old people will probably not receive the vaccine first, um, and people with existing health problems may not receive the vaccine first. After all, they're likely to die in a few years because of other conditions. And so the thought is the vaccine doesn't help them very much, okay? Now, okay, so Harold Schmidt, however, um, raises an objection to this sort of proposal. And Schmidt's objection is that this way of distributing the vaccine would be very unfair to the poor. Why would it be unfair to the poor? Well, as he points out, first of all, the poor tend to have a shorter life expectancy. Right, so going back here, how long will I live with the vaccine or without? Um, Schmidt is pointing out, look, people in poorer neighborhoods are much more likely to die in their 60s or 70s than people in wealthier neighborhoods who may live into their 80s or 90s, right? People who are poor also tend to have, are more likely to have existing medical conditions. They're more likely to have heart disease or diabetes or hypertension, other sorts of medical problems like this. And finally, says, look, people who are poorer tend to already be at higher risk of COVID, right? They're less likely to be able to work from home because of the types of jobs they have. They're more likely to have to take public transportation where you're more at risk of COVID and they're more likely to live in housing where people live closer together, which again increases the risk of COVID. Okay, so Schmidt's objection here, the way to really see it is, look, poor people in society tend to have lots of health problems because they've received, because they haven't been treated equally in the past, because they've received less from society in the past. And now you're using those health problems, which are a result of unequal treatment, to justify further unequal treatment. Okay, so he thinks this would be extremely unfair. And following an idea from Rawls, he has a proposal. The idea from Rawls is when distributing resources, we should help the least advantaged first. 
right? That's the, one of Rawls's key ideas. And so Schmidt, following this, says, well, look, when it comes to healthcare, poorer people tend to be the least advantaged, certainly have fewer advantages with health than the wealthier. And so people living in the poorest neighborhoods should have priority in receiving the vaccine. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point? If not, I'll do this final part where I finish up. Okay. So here's a, there is a complication here though, right? And this is a complication actually pointed out to me by a student in one of my classes. This is sort of another cool thing about um, studying at universities is, you know, you as a student have a chance to contribute, to point things out. It's one of the things I like as a teacher too. Um, my students point things out to me that I might not have noticed myself, right? So what the student pointed out is, look, maybe utilitarians, maybe the utilitarians can agree with Schmidt for utilitarian reasons, right? Maybe it's to the benefit of all of society if we treat people, if we provide the vaccine to poor people first, right? So the utilitarian John Stuart Mill, who was a student of Bentham, in his essay on liberty and in his chapter justice he argues that respecting the rights of others actually leads to more happiness in the long run trying to tr treat people fairly leads to more happiness in the long run right so in response to the point Rawls made that we can't sacrifice a minority of people for the benefit of the majority, Mill points out that maybe a utilitarian should agree, though for slightly different reasons, right? Which is that maybe once in a while, you can benefit society by imposing a sacrifice on a minority. But usually these things turn out very badly. Usually society ends up much less well off when, you, when governments or other institutions do these things. So Schmidt, for example, argues that the poor are more likely to be in danger of catching and spreading COVID than the wealthy. And this is certainly what we've seen in a number of countries, right? After all, they have less chance to isolate themselves in their houses. So they're more at risk of catching COVID and more at risk of spreading it. But that would give a utilitarian who wants to stop the spread of COVID in society in general a reason to agree that we should prioritize vaccinating the poor, right? And as I said, a student pointed this out to me in class last summer. Okay, so the good news, the kind of good news is something that you do see a number of times, which is that utilitarians and people like Kant and Rawls are going to have reasons for agreeing when it comes to practical suggestions about what society should do. Um, the bad news is that if you're interested in these wider philosophical problems, then question like whether Rawls or Bentham has the better moral principle turn out to be somewhat hard to answer. Okay, and uh, that's the end.